Bruce Nystrom. I serve as chair of the Behavior <laughs> Analyst Advisory Committee of the Kansas Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. I ask the members of the advisory committee to respond to a roll call to signify their presence at this open meeting that is being conducted remotely by conference call and other electronic medium. Sorry, Bruce, oh. I think you're... Uh... Your feet is burning. Say again. I think they froze. Yeah, they're, they're frozen. Froze. <laughs> I think he was going to say that he couldn't hear you very well, but mm -hmm. it's their issue. <laughs> Could you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, they're really frozen. Great. And they're the ones live streaming everything. And I don't know. Um, I know. <laughs> I'm going to see if he has emailed anything. No. No emails. They just logged off. So they're probably going to log back in. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait for him to come back up. So, my first day as chair of the advisory committee is going great so far. <laughs> here they are. Can only go uphill from here. That's true. David, can you hear us? He's on mute. He's still not up to go. I saw his head move. Yeah. But their audio was muted. Can you guys hear us? I think we have some technology issues. Going says on. he's muted. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We can hear you now. Can you hear us? Okay. Yes, uh, sorry about that. There were some technology issues over here. Um, but uh, and Bruce, I believe it, our feed cut out a little bit when you were discussing uh, just the beginning part and about to take roll. So could you go ahead and take roll again? Okay, let me just start uh, from the beginning. This is a script that is supposed to be read at the beginning of all meetings. Hello, I am Bruce Nystrom and I serve as chair of the Behavior Analyst Advisory Committee of the Kansas Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. I ask the members of the advisory committee to respond to a roll call to signify their presence at this open meeting that is being conducted remotely by conference call and other electronic medium. Jacqueline Lightcap. Here. Kimberly Becker. Here. Claudia Dozier is not here. Linda Heitzman Powell. Here. Pete Peterson is not here. And Mike Wasmer. I'm here. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm bad on names, so don't be shy about correcting me. I note the following BSRB staff members are also present. David Fye, Leslie here. Allen, and here. Ashley Buskirk. Yeah, and I think uh, actually we'll be logging on from time to time with any technical assistance. So, okay, great. Next, David Fye will read a message concerning this meeting being held remotely. Uh, this is David Fye, Executive Director for the Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. Uh, public comment allows the public to address the advisory committee about its concerns, but the Kansas Open Meeting Act does not require the advisory committee to provide public comment or answer questions from individuals. Uh, but individuals requesting to provide public comment could contact the executive director prior to the meeting by sending an email to david.fi at ks.gov. Um, for this meeting, uh, no individuals had requested to provide public comment, so there will not be public comment at this meeting. Uh, because we are conducting this meeting uh, publicly and remotely uh, by conference call and other teleconference ability, I state for the record the following information. Uh, public access to the meeting is being conducted by a medium of interactive communication that allows members of the public without cost to attend the meeting through the use of the conference call and on the board's YouTube channel. While the meeting is conducted remotely, 
the requirements of COMA are not suspended, so we'll be conducting this meeting pursuant to COMA. Uh, on October 12th, 2021, we sent notice of the advisory committee meeting to all individuals who have requested notice of the advisory committee meetings. The notice was also sent and posted on the board's website, ksbsrb.ks.gov. You may obtain a copy of the notice at that website. An agenda and other media material was posted on the board's website today. And you may request a copy of the agenda by sending an email to david.fi at ks.gov with the subject line request for the agenda and it will be sent to you. The notice contains information for the conference call and YouTube channel that allows members of the public to attend the meeting free of charge. The notice also states that if there are any technical issues during the meeting, uh, please go ahead and send an email to bsrb at ks.gov. A recording of the meeting will be available on the BSRB YouTube channel following the conclusion of the meeting by using the link to the meeting on the agenda. Thank you. So now the meeting is called to order and the advisory committee will begin the discussion of the first agenda item. So if everyone wants to turn to your agenda, does everyone get a copy of that without trouble? Okay. I don't think I did. Um, if you would mind, would that have come from you, Bruce? I'll, I'll go back to my email. No, it would have come from David. Okay, I'll go yeah. back and look through my email. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I sent that out yesterday, um, and there's also one posted on the board's website, um, but we can have somebody send it to you if you don't have a copy of it. So. They'll, they'll send you a copy. Well, luckily, the agenda is not real complicated. It's pretty short. I got it. Thank you. Um, so the first one is to approve the agenda. Does anyone have any um, questions or concerns about the agenda? Anything you want to add or delete from the agenda? So everyone who wants to approve it, say aye. Aye. Anyone disapprove it? Say so verbally. This is Linda. I don't want to disapprove it, but I'm just um, trying to figure out where it's at, David. Like I have the emails. Oh, there it is. It's the last, it was listed last. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. I have everything else opened okay, up. You got it now? The last one. I've got it now. Thank okay, you. great. I'm fine with it. <laughs> Good. Anyone not fine with it? Seeing no one responding to that, we'll go ahead and approve the agenda. Uh, I do want to make a, a comment that we don't have minutes. And the reason is that the last time this advisory board met was in 2018. And we don't have minutes from that for some reason, that's been a long time ago. So, uh, well, and Bruce, I believe, yeah, I believe the minutes from the, the last meeting were already approved, uh, but, but it has been about three years since the advisory committee met. And so uh, we'll be taking minutes from this meeting and we'll bring them back at future meetings for you to review and approve. Yeah, we'll be more on schedule after this. So new business, advisory committee membership. Um, we have, uh, a small advisory committee now, and we've uh, put out a call for people who would be interested in uh, being considered uh, to join the advisory committee. Did everyone get a hold of those uh, statements? It should be uh, a statement from each candidate and then a resume for each one. Okay, so what I thought we'd do is we'd go through and uh, discuss them one at a time in the order I have them. And, and Bruce, before you go into the candidate discussion, would you like me to go ahead and I provided a, another document in the media materials that outlines sort of the review process uh, for the board okay. of governance. So you wanna go over that? Sure, I think that'd be helpful just to kind of frame the discussion. So, okay, so what he's talking about, does everyone have a copy of a uh, one page document saying advisory committees for the behavioral sciences regulatory board? Does everyone read through that? Uh, this is the, uh, the guidance that we have from, from the board as to the advisory committee. 
Uh, one thing, and David, you can correct me, it says here that there'll be a, a minimum of three members for the advisory committee. And when we met as a board Monday, uh, uh, a maximum number of 10 was discussed. Yes. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and if you, so, if you want, I, I can briefly go down this page and just kind of summarize. Okay, the, pull up. Yeah, that'd be fine. Go ahead. Great. Uh, well, there's been a couple changes since the last time the advisory committee met. Um, when, when last you met, the, the advisory committee was uh, had a little different formation. So I believe there were four board members that served on the advisory committee. Uh, the board had a discussion about that topic and uh, decided to make a change to sync it up with some of the other advisory committees. Um, most of the other advisory committees have a professional member of the board as the chair and then a public member. So the board went ahead at a recent board meeting and voted to do that. So that's why you have uh, two members of the board here versus what you may have seen in the past in terms of more board members. Um, also, uh, in the past, two other members of the advisory committee, uh, Linda Virgin uh, and also Dan Peterson, uh, we had reached out to anyone who was previously on the advisory committee to see if they wish to continue to serve or if they uh, were no longer able to serve or, you know, we're not we're not willing, wishing to serve any longer. Um, those two individuals indicated that they appreciated their time working on the advisory committee, but they needed to step away. So that's why those two members have decided to kind of roll off the advisory committee. Um, in terms of the sort of the discussion of new advisory committee members, uh, as it was mentioned, you did receive a one page handout on the advisory committee process and the purpose of advisory committees. Uh, that document sort of outlines what advisory committees are under the BSRB and the purpose that they serve. Uh, so just as a summary, the advisory committee's uh, purpose is supporting the board and carrying out its mission to protect the public. Um, they uh, deal with issues relating to informing, licensing, and disciplining of the persons who are regulated by the board. And um, what the advisories, advisory committees do is they address issues referred to it by the board uh, through the advisory committee chairperson or the executive director. And the members of the advisory committee may also suggest issues or make recommendations to the board uh, through the chair of the advisory committee regarding those different topics. Um, in terms of what Bruce was just commenting on in terms of how many members should be on the advisory committee, uh, the board governance policy does have some language which talks about board membership. Uh, it previously indicated there should be a minimum of three non-board members on the advisory committee, uh, but it didn't speak to how many uh, in terms of a maximum. Uh, but recently the board met and uh, voted to go ahead and have a maximum of non-board members be 10. Uh, so that's what the current limitation is in terms of uh, board members. Um, the uh, terms of the advisory committees are two-year terms, uh, but members can serve up to four terms. So in general, eight years on the advisory committees is sort of the limitation on the length of service. Um, and then they recommend advisory committees should be staggered so that new members are added over time. Um, and then the policies and procedures under the BSRB board members are expected to also apply to any members on the advisory committees. In terms of the selection process, members of the advisory committee uh, can be nominated by anyone and what we did in this case is back on July 20th, we sent a letter to all licensees asking them if they wish to serve on the advisory committee to send a resume and letter of interest to me. And when I collected those documents, um, we went ahead and provided those to you all to look over so that you could have a discussion on potential members to add to the advisory committee. Um, the board governance policy indicates in reviewing nominations, the advisory committees should work to ensure there is representation based on geographical, gender, and public versus private settings. The members should provide representations on the level of licensing for the discipline. And it's suggested that those members be selected from among public and private practitioners. When the board recently met, uh, it discussed if, that, um, if, if those elements are sufficient or if more items should be added. Um, and I believe um, ethnicity and, and cultural type diversity was also expressed and it was also clarified by the board that these were items the board specifically wanted to look for representation, but this wasn't meant to be the only things that could be looked for in terms of providing representation. So I wanted to point those out to you. Uh, the advisory committee discusses nominations, uh, which includes reviewing the documents that you have received and um, discusses those in an open meeting. So committee of the whole discussion, we're not allowed to have 
secret ballots or anything like that if you come down to having to vote on members. Um, the chairperson of the advisory committee uh, will take the recommended names from the advisory committee and submit those to the chair of the board. It's the chair of the board who has ultimate authority to add people to the advisory committee. And so the chair of the board will receive the list of nominations uh, of anybody who had requested consideration and also the recommendations from the advisory committee. And the chair of the board has the ability to request additional input prior to making the decision on adding people. And then um, ultimately, the chair of the BSRB will add members at an official board meeting. And so that's the process that would take place. And then it says here that the executive director would contact anyone who was added to the advisory committee to, uh, to help with the process. And so just kind of wanted to outline what you had received and then some very recent changes and updates to some of that language. Um, but in terms of my role as executive director, I'm happy to help with the mechanics to enable you to have a discussion and reach recommendation on new members. Um, but in terms of any preference for one licensee or one individual or another, uh, I'm gonna be a neutral party in this. So I'll help you with facilitating that discussion or um, if you have any questions on any of the guidelines, um, but I'll, I'll probably stay neutral in terms of uh, recommending one person or the other. And so, uh, do you have any questions on anything that was discussed in terms of the the process. I'd be happy to answer any of those type of questions. Okay, no thank problem. you, David. Um, one thing I'd like to throw in is uh, there's some faces here I'm not familiar with. I don't know everyone that's on this call, and uh, some of you probably don't know me. So I thought if we could take a, a short minute here just to quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, uh, who we are, where we are, what we do, and why we're especially good people that uh, everyone should know. So I'll start. I'm Bruce Nystrom. I'm a psychologist in Wichita. Uh, been here while well, I was born and raised in Wichita, so I haven't, I haven't escaped yet. Uh, I'm in private practice, been in private practice for a long time. This is my third year on BSRB. Um, I am also the uh, chair of the Complaint Review Committee, so I hope I never see your faces or anything like that in connection with that, my role there. Uh, and there was a little bit of a confusion when I came on board. Uh, the previous executive director told me that since I was doing the Complaint Review Committee that I didn't need to participate in anything else. So. I've not been participating in advisory committees. And uh, so now I, I find out that I'm the chair of this committee and I'm also on the psychology advisory committee. So uh, my role expanded quite a bit here very recently. Um, Jacqueline, you wanna go next? Yes. So I'm Jacqueline Lightcap and I live in Topeka. I'm a public member of the BSRB and I am on the CRC with Bruce. Um, I am also on the advisory committee for addiction counselors and this one. And um, I actually have just been on the BSRB a little over a year. So I'm, I'm a newer member and uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's it. Oh, and as far as, so I'm obviously not in the field because I'm a public member. I work uh, for the League of Women Voters of Kansas. That's my day job. I work with advocacy. And um, so that's what I do. And I have two kids in high school here in Topeka. Thank you. Linda. I'm Linda Heisman Powell, and I'm the Director of Community Research here at the University of Kansas Medical Center. I also started a nonprofit back in 2002 to work with families and children impacted by autism in the state back before behavior analysis was recognized as a profession. Um, I've been involved in a lot of advocacy work over the years um, with several members that are on here um, as well as we tried to get insurance, advocated for insurance reform for kids with autism and participated with the state, um, getting their early autism waiver up and running. So um, I was, um, I think because of that advocacy work, I was invited to be on the original BSRB, Behavior Analyst Subcommittee, um, to provide 
um, inside as we became a licensed profession in the state of Kansas. And so I'm happy to be a part of this endeavor as well. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly. Hi, I'm Kimberly Becker. I am in Wichita, Kansas. I'm a board certified behavior analyst and a licensed behavior analyst in the state of Kansas. I'm also the CEO of Little Stars Therapy Services here in Wichita. We serve children and families impacted by autism. Um, I kind of have a little bit of the same background as Linda. I also started in this field advocating many, many moons ago for applied behavior analysis in the state of Kansas, um, worked on the waiver committee, and then also on this committee when it first started. Thank you. Mike. Hello, I'm Mike Wasmer. I am vice president of government affairs and special projects for the Council of Autism Service Providers, which is the international nonprofit trade association for autism service provider organizations. Um, prior to taking this position two years ago, I was director of government affairs at Autism Speaks for about a decade and uh, worked on autism insurance reform here in Kansas and around the country. Um, I live in Olathe and I have a, a young adult daughter uh, with autism. Thank you. David, you want to briefly introduce yourself again? Sure. Uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, my name is David Fye. I'm the executive director for the Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. Uh, coming up on the end of my first year with the agency, I came on board mid-November last year. Uh, got a chance to work with the previous executive director, Max Foster, until he retired on January 8th. Uh, so I've communicated with all of you over email, but it's nice to be able to put a face with a name and look forward to working with you all more in the future. Thank you. Leslie, you want to briefly introduce yourself? I'm Leslie Allen. I'm the Assistant Director and Licensing Manager for the BSRB. Um, I have been with the agency since 1999, and I worked with all of you um, when we were doing the regulations for behavior analysts. Thank you. So these two people have a wealth of information, history of the uh, organization, and all sorts of details that I'm missing and I turn to them to help fill in my gaps. So thank you very much. There's also Ashley Van Buskirk, who is on the staff. She's not on this call per se, but she'll be the one who will uh, review the YouTube uh, presentation, uh, make minutes of the meeting from that. And we'll have those minutes to review at our next meeting. So now, Everyone want to uh, go through these applicants? Before we start, I think yeah. um, I did a little, um, and, um, and Mike may have found something on Pete on Facebook, but um, I reached out to a contact of mine and he's still showing as active at Johnson County Community College as faculty there. So I don't know if somebody wants to see if they can reach him through that faculty appointment. Um, he's still listed on the website. So I just want to make okay. sure that gets in there. Yeah, and you're talking about Pete Peterson, who was a previous uh -huh. member or uh, formerly on the advisory committee. And we had tried to reach out to him, but in the contact information we had was uh, no longer would work to access him. So we'll, we'll keep trying to reach him to see uh, if he's interested in continuing on for the advisory committee. Okay, and I'll see if I can find a different way to contact him as well. All right, thank you. I also have a question too, Bruce, before we get started. I know that you previously discussed the minimum number required and the maximum. Um, can you remind me where we are and you know, are we in need of adding any to fulfill the minimum requirement? Um, so I guess I just want to kind of have some context before we dive into prioritizing you know, the applicants and how well, many we need, if any. We have, we have three advisory board members uh, on this uh, on this call now, so we fulfill the minimum of three. And um, I think there's two others, David, if I'm correct. The yes. So um, so there's there's two board members who are on the advisory committee, and then in terms of non-board members, um, you know, if, if uh, we contacted everyone who had previously been on, and if they indicated that they are no longer able to serve. 
um, they just kind of rolled off the advisory committee. So in terms of the non-board members, uh, there are currently five individuals right now. Um, and, and it does talk about the need for terms to be staggered so that when the terms are up, not everyone you know, comes off the advisory committee at the same time. But yeah, I think in terms of non-board members right now, your, your group is at five. And then one other question, and you mentioned um, the importance of uh, seeking diversity. Um, how are we um, determining um, that from the cover letters and CEUs and from the CVs? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there's a few things that the board governance policy specifically pointed to to look at. Um, one thing is, you know, in terms of gender, um, another thing is in terms of geographical representation. Um, and so I did go ahead and look into the, the five non-board members on the committee. Um, two are currently from Lawrence, uh, or that's the last information that we have, two in Lawrence, uh, one in Wichita, one in McLeod, and then one in Olathe. Um, and so those are the different areas in terms of non-board members that are represented. Uh, so geographic is one of them, gender is one. Um, looking to try to have a balance um, in terms of um, any members that are in public um, or in private practice, um, and also if there's anyone in the field of education looking for sort of a blend if possible between those areas. Um, in terms of some of the other areas the board recently looked at in terms of cultural diversity, um, you know, I think if someone had volunteered that information, um, in their letter, um, you know, definitely take things into account that you are aware of. Um, but that has been a recent change, and that was a sort of incorporated by the board after we had received all of this information. Um, so previously, it talked about level of licensure, uh, gender, geographic area, and, um, you know, different areas of practice, such as private, public, and uh, education. And while we're talking about this, David, I noticed that one of the uh, people that submitted information is actually residing in Texas. Um, does that, I mean, should we consider that? Or is that a rule out or how do we approach that? that that's a good question. Um, there have been some other advisory committees where individuals uh, did apply um, if they you know, resided or they practiced outside of the state. Um, nothing in the board governance policy says that is an automatic rule out, um, but that is just something for you to consider. Um, the board governance policy does say that um, the same uh, guidelines that would apply to board members should apply to advisory committee members as well. Um, so I would you know, take that into consideration and, and weigh that sort of on an individual basis um, in, in terms of how you think that may impact their ability to fill their responsibilities. Um, but it's not an automatic rule out. It's just something to, uh, to factor in if, if you have feelings on that as it relates to the ability of somebody to be a, a good advisory committee member. Okay. Mike, does that address your, your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I will go through these uh, in the order I have them. Uh, the first one will be Allison Bell. She's uh, from Wichita. She's been uh, working in uh, behavior analysis for more than 12 years. Uh, and her current position is director of autism services at HeartSpring, as well as uh, she's a doctoral student completing her, uh, her PhD right now. I believe it's through Walden, if I remember. Um, No, I'm sorry, she's uh, working on her PhD through Capella. She got uh, a master's degree through uh, Kaplan University and bachelor's of KU. So, uh, first of all, does anyone know her personally, her reputation or? I know her and I've known her since before she was ever in school while she was still working on her bachelor's. She worked with me at that private um, nonprofit that I was telling you about. 
And um, it was because of that experience that she decided to go to school to become a BCBA. So she's been a, a advocate for behavior analytic services from um, for a long time, from the beginning. I think she has a, personally, I think she has a high degree of integrity with regards to my previous experience with her. Yeah, I've, I've worked with Allison on several cases over the past uh, couple of years. Um, her organization is a member of CASP and um, worked with her on several projects and I would concur with Linda's assessment. I, uh, <clears throat> obviously, I also know Allison. Um, Allison worked under me at HeartSpring. I was the director of autism services and pediatric services at HeartSpring. And she started there as a board certified assistant behavior analyst. So you guys know her, know her very well. Um, am I hearing a, a, a groundswell of support that she would be a good addition to the advisory committee uh, or not? I think she would be a good addition to the advisory committee. How about I would room? agree, but I guess, I mean, are we gonna go through all of them before? We... Well, I don't know. I, I don't have a, a set plan for that. Do you wanna go through all of them and then uh, talk about which ones we want to forward on to, uh, to the board as uh, recommended members? Yeah, and Bruce, maybe I can help out in this in this a little bit. So the board governance policy doesn't really set a, a specific process that each of the advisory committees have to follow in reviewing applicants or make recurring recommendations. Um, I can tell you the other a lot of other advisory committees are following you know this same process in terms of reviewing candidates. Um, on average, the advisory committees are adding uh, about three members, most of them, based on you know, openings and if anybody's coming off the committee because they've reached their maximum terms of service. Um, so that's kind of been what they have been looking for. Um, the most popular method I have seen from the other advisory committees is that um, some of the committees just opened it up and, and some went candidate by candidate. Other ones said, you know, if you have a few that stood out to you, um, go ahead and offer those up and then have a discussion. Um, it kind of depends. Some of the other advisory committees, like the Social Work Advisory Committee had 30 applicants. Professional Counseling had around 15. Um, so with the size of applicants, you kind of free to do different methods, however you would like to do. Um, but some of the, the most popular method, I think, has been um, individuals on the advisory committee sort of highlighted their, their top few that stood out to them and then talked about that. And then the committee looked to see if there was consensus or if that overlapped. But like I said before, you know, you have some freedom to go ahead and decide how you would like it just has to all be in a public meeting. And if you do come down to, you know, trying to figure out the last member, um, one of the committees had a vote, but any votes like that would have to be a public type vote. Okay, so uh, with that, do, uh, does, why don't we uh, just proceed and go through these and uh, see, um, if we start to get a rank ordering of uh, who we would want to, uh, whose names we would like to forward and uh, go from there. Does anyone, everyone agree with that approach? And yeah. We know we can have a maximum of 10. Yeah. And, and we have currently, um, well, we have five here today, but do we, I, I was not clear on if we need to include those other folks that were invited but didn't come today. Yeah, so, so the, the, yeah, I can clarify that. So there, there are currently five uh, non-board members on the advisory committee and the board governance policy talks to a limitation okay. on board members. So yeah, you, you could add as many as five new members if you wanted to, to get up to that 10. So it's board non, board ten, the 10 is non-BSRB board members. Okay, thank you. That's that correct. Helps. Okay. Yep. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, the next uh, person is uh, 
Bethany Garcia. Uh, she says she's been working in behavioral analysis since 2006, been a board certified BA since 2016, and currently uh, works at Posi Behavior Supports Corporation. Does, uh, does anyone know her? Is she known to the, to the rest of you? She's from Kansas City. I do know her. Um, she actually started as a behavior tech technologist or a technician um, in probably 2006 at Heart Springs. So she was one of my first techs that we hired when we started doing autism services um, under the autism waiver. So she's also been doing this for a while and grown up in the field. Okay, she's definitely in the uh, treatment provider category, correct? Yes. Okay, any other comments about Bethany? Okay, next on the list is uh, Emily Kessler. She's from Leewood. Says that currently she's the vice chair of the Kansas Institute for Positive, Healthy, and Inclusive Committees Board, Communities Board. She's a state trainer for behavior and social emotional functioning. And um, let's see, her um, beta. She has a bachelor's from. Uh, Washburn, a master in special ed from KU, a master in educational administration from Emporia, and a postgraduate certificate in behavior analysis from Arizona State. Is Emily known to the rest of you? Um, she's known peripheral, peripherally to me. Um, she worked with some of my distance-based teams. Um, and it looks to me like um, on her Vita that she um, has a lot of experience in the schools. Yes, she does. So just to throw that out there, that if you're looking at diversity, um, she seems to have, um, she came to us through the school system, worked for her supervision hours while she was employed at the school. So, anyone else have contact with her? Okay. Our next one is Monica Labrie. She has a doctorate from Walden University in Educational Psych, a master's in Applied Behavior Analyst Analysis from Houston, University of Houston, and a bachelor's from University of Houston. This is the woman who lives in Katy, Texas at this point. Uh, she's applying because I uh, can't find the name of her the company, okay. she worked, but she works in several states but she's physically located in Texas. I don't know her, but um, it does look like the organization that she works for serves um, individuals in multiple states and she has worked in multiple states. So, you know, I think that there may be some value in bringing somebody on that you know, has personal experience with uh, licensure in other states. I think bringing that perspective may be helpful. So maybe the multi-state is a strength for her. Is what you're saying? I think I think it could be. Does anyone else have any comments about Monica? Okay, the next one is Danielle Parrot. Parrot. I'm not sure how she pronounces that. She's from uh, Wichita. She uh, currently works at Rainbows United, 
I've been there since 2018. Um, and really, as I think that's really her only job in behavior analysis. Does anyone know Danielle? I don't know her personally. Um, I've been on several email correspondence with her as we're advocating for CPT code coverage, um, as we um, have um, looked to um, um, provide um, billing oversight. And um, she's a pretty good advocate and understands the logistics behind clinical services, but that's all I know about her. She seems to be pretty responsive, but. I don't do. know Sorry. her. And I guess she listed that she's on the Sedgwick CDEO work group that includes me, Linda, and Kim. I, I don't know that I'm on that group. <laughs> You were probably invited. If I, am, I haven't been to everything. <laughs> I saw that too, Mike. I was like, uh. I do know Danielle. I actually was her clinical supervisor for her um, board certified behavior analyst, um, her supervision hours. And I did also supervise her at Rainbows as well. So yeah, she, um, she was a, a paraprofessional in a classroom and fell in love with ABA that way. Mm -hmm. And then um, came to work at Rainbows and I, I supervised her there. And now she is, she's the only BCBA they have now at Rainbows. She's the only one? It seems like they would have more. Well, I'm glad that they have one. I well, know. Yeah. Okay. It, took, it took a while, but they, they do have one now. Good for them. Anything else about Danielle. Okay, the next person is Christy, I believe, Steele. She's uh, been a behavior analyst since 2008. She, uh, she right now, it says she owns like a private practice for the last year, year and a half uh, in behavioral counseling. And she also works at the Kids TLC Trellis Center. I'm not familiar with that. She works at both of those currently. I met uh, Christy. She had initially applied for a job here at K Med Center when she first moved here from um, California. And then um, briefly uh, thought about um, how we could collaborate with her in home and community based services. She's sharp. She's like, if I'd had the money, I would have hired her, but I didn't have the money, so I couldn't hire her. She, um, so instead of, um, she, she got that position with TLC, um, but then also started her own business on the side. She understands the science behind what, it, what we do, and she definitely comes from a background of um, clinical services in California and also the um, academic side as well. So. She, um, I, I have not seen her clinical work. I just know in, in um, discussion with her that she's sharp. She I, understands it. So it wasn't clear to me, but does it sound like uh, she works at TLC full time and then her private practice is like a side gig on, on top of that? That's my understanding. Okay. She's in Lawrence. Anyone else know Christy, Christine? She's a newbie. A newbie? A newbie in Kansas. <laughs> yeah. She, she has experience in other states as well. Uh-huh, yeah. she does. In California. Yeah, she's been around. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay, and the last person we had is... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to make one other comment about okay. Christy, is that she's um, um, 
worked as a transition specialist. So a lot of the times we get folks that are um, really familiar with early childhood or elementary age kids. She worked for CARD, which is a nationally known entity as their transition specialist, connecting um, individuals with ASD to college programs. So she does have experience in, with the older population as well. Okay. Moving on, we have Alice Zhang. Zhang. Zhang, sorry. I told you I'm not good on names. She's uh, a licensed behavior analyst, uh, board certified, works at KU Center in Kansas City as a clinician and researcher. Mm -hmm. uh, from looking at her Vita, it looks as if she uh, joined or she came to this country, I'm not sure when, but uh, some of her early training and experience was in China. Mm -hmm. She has, uh, her vita is very, very lengthy in terms of publications and presentations and, and such. So it looks much more uh, academic, uh, you know, coming from an academician as opposed to a practitioner. She has on here, she did work in Claudia Dozier's lab. So I noticed Claudia was part of this committee as well, so. Okay. Yeah, she works with me here at KMED Center, full disclosure. Um, I encouraged her to apply for this. Uh, she does come from China. Um, she's also, um, when we look at, um, um, look at diversity, she um, has, um, She's very proficient in advocating for people with physical disabilities as well. Um, a lot of her work with Glenn White on her Vita um, comes from, Glenn was, a, um, wheel, was wheelchair bound. And so she did a lot of work with physical disabilities and spinal cord injury. Um, and um, so she also was a LEND trainee which is that leadership in education and neurodevelopmental and related disabilities, which has an advocacy focus and a, um, a broader perspective of like wraparound um, services for individuals. And her niche, she comes from the University of Kansas Lawrence campus, where she did work with Glenn White and Martha Hodgesmith and Claudia Dozier. Um, and that's where she got her um, pre-service training. So she is a, not just a BCBA, um, but she's a BCBAD, meaning she got her education at the doctoral level. Okay. Anyone else know Alice? Okay. So we have, sounds like we have seven well-qualified candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as diversity goes, um, they're all female. So I know. <laughs> don't, don't have any guys. And they're very much on the eastern side of the state, except for a couple in Wichita. Yep. Yeah, nothing west of Wichita. So, again, western Kansas kind of gets the short end of the state. Maybe but ha having before. said that, I think that um, Emily, does she have um, where, like previous, I think she might have been from the Manhattan and like she worked in Gardner, um, which, you know, is Southern Kansas City, but I think she, um, um, you know, she looked, worked on that multi-system tier support statewide. So I think she's had some experience in rural areas. I'd like to advocate for that. Yeah, she does list that. <clears throat> so I have to leave in about a minute or two. I have to pick my kids up from school and Wednesday's an early release day. I'm sorry. Um, but I don't know if you want me to, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. These all sound great. I would be fine with whoever you all choose. So, um, you know. Is that good enough? <laughs> Do you still have to? 
No, we want you to stay here for another 20 minutes and discuss. <laughs> and let my kids wait out in the rain. No. <laughs> yes. Is it raining? So I actually I did make a little rank. I really liked Alice and Christy, Emily and Allison. So those are my top four. But honestly, the others were, were really good too, though. I just I heard some really good things about their variety and diversity that I liked. So Sorry, could you say their names again? Sure, uh, Alice, up. Alice and Christy, and Emily and Allison were the four I would put in my top rank. But I, the others also looked had, they had good resumes as well. Thank you. I know that we had discussed that there's a max of ten, but is there any feeling among the folks on the call whether we want to max out? We don't have to. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just questioning. I mean, sometimes a bigger group gets a little more difficult to accomplish things. Well, so I, I guess I'm sort of inclined to not necessarily max out unless we had like 10 stellar folks that we wanted on. Yeah, and that's why we put a limit of 10 on, you know, because like David mentioned, Social Work had 30 applicants for their advisory committee. That's certainly, you know, might be an unworkably large group of people. But no, we don't have to max out. Um, <clears throat> there's five now, and we could add anywhere from one to five more. So we have a lot of options. I mean, I think. Um... You know, along the lines of uh, diversity and bringing uh, fresh ideas in. I mean, I, I, like was mentioned, there are two folks that have experience working in multiple states. Um, you know, I think we might consider at least one of those. Um, uh, there's also an applicant that has a strong educational background, and I think bringing experience with providing services in an educational setting. Um, would be a value, um, and uh, uh, you know, Alice, you know, brings the cultural diversity as well. So I think those would be comments I would have. You would be looking at Alice, and perhaps Emily, and perhaps Monica, um, or Christy. Down. The, there were two. Christy lives in Kansas. The other one doesn't. She yeah. lives in Texas. Right. And you guys know Christy, right? As yeah. opposed to the other one. So. Yeah, I don't know the other one. I have met with Christy on probably half a dozen occasions. <clears throat> yeah, so Emily and Christy, I guess, is really. Mm -hmm. So I think those are my top three picks. I would throw Allison in as my, if, if we were doing four. I agree. And I have to agree with Jacqueline that the other ones sound good too, but none of them stood out to me as having the kind of the longevity of experience and the breadth of experience and the diversity. Okay, I'm not looking at the Zoom screen right now, but uh, Kimberly, have we heard from you on this issue? I agree. I, I think those top three, um, I agree with, with those that Mike and Linda also. Okay, so who, just to make sure, who's on the top three? Alice, Christy, and Alice. Well, Emily? Was yeah, that Emily. 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 Yeah, yeah Emily and I think we all, that. Allison was kind of a fourth for a lot of it. Yeah, but the top three were those. Hang on, my pen just died. So Christy, and who else? Emily Kessler. Emily. Alice Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G. Yeah. And then the fourth pick would be Allison Bell. And then the rest of them are... Um, well qualified, but they don't stand out as much. Okay. Well, you guys know these people a lot better than I do. 
uh, you know, from it's a small field. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at the paperwork, I mean, there's, none of them are are weak or you know, right. by, by any means. Um, okay, David, let me ask you a question. If we're going to stagger membership onto the advisory committee, how does that work? I mean, we've got five on now. If we add up to four more, uh, how would that be uh, staggered? Well, so um, what a lot of the other advisory committees are doing is they are adding members now, and then we're trying to formalize this process a little bit more so that each year, if members are coming off of advisory committees, they have the opportunity to add more members then, maybe sometime around you know April or May. Um, so in the interest of staggering, it may be helpful to add a few now and then maybe revisit that um, next year in terms of adding anyone or if anyone drops off. Um, so that's, that's something that a lot of the advisory committees are doing instead of maxing out at the moment. They're trying to add a few now in the interest of adding a few in the future so that um, you know, you'll have a situation where members can drop off in future years, but you won't lose a majority of the advisory committee at any one time. So the members that are already on the advisory committee, um, are we gonna put a you know, date uh, for the end of their two year term or what? Yeah, that's one thing we need to do a little research on um, to find the, the years that some of those terms started. And you know, I think there is still the, you know, the topic too of, with the advisory committee not meeting for a little bit, how the board wants to look at you know, those years. Um, so that's something that we'll be bring back to the board at the next board meeting to get some clarity on. Um, so yeah, because I was going to say if you go back to the beginning, Kim, Mike, and I have already maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> and Claudia may it be. Yeah, Claudia too. <laughs> so we don't want to lose all of you at once. <laughs> I guess the years the, the, count, the committee wasn't meeting don't count on that two year thing. <laughs> That's probably something the board might have to discuss um, because, like we mentioned, the, the committee hasn't met in a few years, um, so they might have some feedback on how to how to weigh that. So, okay, so I'm hearing there's a lot of fluidity and all this stuff. Um, so, let me just throw out an idea here. Do we want to? Um, somehow extend invitations to Christy, Emily, Alice, and Allison um, currently and keep everyone else uh, on, on what, standby basis, you know, later on as uh, people rotate off of the uh, committee that uh, they would come up for consideration if they wish to be considered later on. And the other thing with, um, with looking at um, the four instead of three is that we may not be able to get a hold of Pete Peterson. Yeah, true. And so we may be down one anyway. And then if we had, that would leave us at eight, I believe. And then that way, when um, we go to schedule these meetings, um, invariably like Claudia couldn't be here today, right? And so that would leave somewhere between four and seven people that would be available that were non-board members. So just trying to look at the logistics of how it actually played out. And before I think, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, you um, were you at all of the previous meetings, Kim? Or did you? I think so. I might've missed one or two. Yeah, and so I think because we're all busy professionals, we have, you know, logistically, we're going to have one to three people that aren't going to be able to make the meetings. And so we need to have enough committee members that we feel like we have enough meat available to discuss any issues that come up. So that's my two cents on it. Any other input?
So David, how would this work if we uh, forward these four names to you? Would they be considered to, to be joining the committee currently, immediately, or uh, do two so, at a time? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the board governance policy indicates that the chair of the board has the ability to add members to an advisory committee. Uh, so it's the role of the advisory committee to make a recommendation. Um, and so what I've been doing is trying to formalize the process is I've been taking the recommendations for uh, new members to the committee and sort of drafting a letter uh, to the chair of the board. And, and Bruce, I'll, I'll send you a copy of that letter when it's drafted and you let you a chance to take a look at it. Um, and then if you're okay with me sending it, then I'll send it on to the chair of the board. And uh, it says in the board governance policy that the names that will be provided to the chair of the board, the chair of the board will have the opportunity to uh, collect additional input uh, or request input. Um, and so how we've been doing that is the, the chairs have the opportunity to do that between when the advisory committee makes a recommendation and the next full board meeting. And if there's no issues, then uh, the chair has been asking me to list those appointees on the board's agenda. And then when the board meets the board, uh, the chair basically says, here are the people that I'm appointing to the advisory committee. So, uh, so they would be added as long as there's no issues, um, like I said, ultimately it's the chair's decision on who gets added to the advisory committee, but the recommendations would be forwarded to the chair of the board and then they could be added at the next board meeting, which would be on November 8th. Okay, so it's not like the board, as I recall on our last agenda, we did not vote to approve the, the names that came up. Uh, it was just on the agenda that these people are being added to the various advisory com committees. Right, because the, the board governance policy says it's the authority of the chair of the board to appoint people to the advisory committees. Okay. Uh, so as long as the chair of the board approves, we were just making, we're, when that has occurred, it occurs at a board meeting, so they get listed on the board's agenda, but it's ultimately the board's decision, or the, the chair of the board's decision, rather than a board vote. Okay. So does everyone follow that? Clear as mud? <laughs> But, but the, main, the main takeaway is that if you make recommendations to add uh, those four members today, what I'll do is I will draft that in a letter and then Bruce, I'll send it to you to take a look at. And then if you agree that it can be sent on to the chair of the board, I'll send that letter to the chair of the board. And then the chair of the board will have the opportunity to review it. And then she can request additional input. Um, but if she agrees with the recommendations, she would appoint those members at the next full board meeting on November 8th. Okay. Sounds good to me. And for you guys who are not on the board, the current uh, board chair is Leslie Seawester. She's uh, actually a public member, but also a licensee in uh, addiction counseling. But she's the current uh, board chair. And, so, and Bruce, just to make, make absolutely clear, the, the four people, it sounds like that are recommended would be uh, Allison Bell, uh, Emily Kessler, Christy Steele and Alice Zhang. Is that correct? That's what I have. Okay. Everyone else have those same four names? Yes. All right. Thank you. Everyone happy with that? Okay. I'll play auctioneer. Going once, going twice, going three times. Bang. It's done. So. Sorry about my phone ringing in the background. I don't know how to stop it. But I just heard back from one of my contacts and they said Pete Peterson is now the chair of the department at Johnson County Community College. And it should be, I don't know what email address it. I can't drop it in the chat because there's no chat function available yeah, here. Linda, if you don't mind, just go ahead and send that to me in an email. I'd be happy to reach out to him. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah. Thank Thanks. Thanks for getting that info. Okay. Congratulations, thank you for all that. Uh, it brings up our next issue on the agenda, uh, which is, uh, is called Next Meeting. Uh, David and I discussed this. Uh, the next meeting, if we meet, um, how often do you guys wanna meet? Once every 10 years? <laughs> or do you wanna meet more often than that? Um, we discussed, perhaps since uh, the committee 
has really not been functional for some time and we're adding uh, a lot of people. Perhaps if we could uh, schedule a meeting somewhat in the near future, perhaps December, uh, and get everyone together, and make more of a cohesive working group, and then uh, decide how often we want to meet on a re regular ongoing basis from that. Any feedback on that idea? Yeah, I think it makes sense. That's fine. Yep. Okay. Uh, so. And what, Bruce, what, go ahead. What, I, what I've been doing to assist with some of the scheduling is uh, uh, I can send out a doodle poll with yep. some possible date options in December. Um, and so. Yeah, that'd be great. So I'll be looking for an email from uh, David about a doodle poll. Um, and we'll see. If, I mean, there's never a time when we'll probably get everyone together, uh, get as many as possible together at once. So now the other issue that uh, other than, you know, just kind of a hi, how are you doing uh, at the next meeting? Um, you know, if you read the, uh, the thing that David gave as far as the, uh, the structure of the advisory committee, technically I'm not supposed to be on the advisory committee because I'm not a behavior analyst. Um, but there's not a behavior analyst on BSRB. Um, brings up the issue, should there be a behavior analyst on BSRB? And then they would, their function then would become, uh, as well as a board member, become uh, the chair of this advisory committee that would expand the BSRB. And David can tell us, but that's going to take some uh, legislative activity and some other issues like that. But I wanted to throw out initially to see what kind of response you guys have to that idea. Yeah, if you guys have to remind me, but I think this did come up very early on. And I think the reason it was um, not pursued is because it would require additional legislation. Um, you know, if it were possible, I think it would be ideal to have a behavior analyst on the the SRB. I concur, Mike. That's exactly what happened was we were advocating for a member to be on um, the BSRB itself, and it would require legislative proceedings in order to be able to increase the membership of the BSRB. But I, I also agree that I think there should be a behavior analyst. Kimberly, how do you feel? I completely agree. Okay. So uh, we will uh, have that as uh, a major part of our agenda for the next meeting. Uh, and uh, David, he didn't say about his background, but he comes to BSRB after serving for some time on the state. Let me get this right. Revision committee, is that right? Well, so prior to coming over to the BSRB, I worked for eight years with the legislative research department, uh, primarily as a principal fiscal analyst. And I was uh, that agency's, one of, one of the, the health experts for their office and uh, specifically in the area of mental health, which is how I became familiar with a lot of the mental health workings in the state with KDADS and the state hospitals and the BSRB. Um, and last year I was the, lead coordinator from that office on the special committee on mental health modernization reform, uh, which met several times last fall and is meeting again. They got renewed for more meeting dates this year. Uh, so I played a very active role with that prior to coming over to the BSRB. So he's our go-to guy when it comes to uh, proposing legislation and all this and that. He has a tremendous amount of working knowledge. He has uh, the contacts, uh, he knows how to get stuff done. We got a big bill through this year. Uh, so yeah, we can talk about that as, uh, you know, opening up the statutes and, you know, changing it to include a new member 
may not be as daunting of a task as it may have been in the past. So anyway, we'll discuss that. Keep that in the back of your mind. David, do you know, um, aside from the fiscal impact of, you know, and I don't know if this would be a part-time or full-time position if there were to uh, be the possibility to add a behavior analyst to the BSRB. Do you know, and feel free not to <laughs> be frank, I mean, uh, where would the opposition come from? Do you think there would be opposition within BSRB? Um, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I a lot of the uh, history of behavior analysts kind of before my time uh, working with the BSRB. Um, I, in terms of the in terms of the fiscal impact, uh, you know, the board members are not really paid a salary. Um, they're compensated for days that you know they hold meetings, either board meetings or advisory committee meetings. Thirty-two um, bucks a month. Thirty-two <laughs> bucks a month. I don't know. Any any fiscal note will uh, might sink us. You know how. <laughs> <laughs> there is some there is some reimbursement when we have more in person meetings for things like mileage and, and things like that. Uh, so there is some cost to it, um, but I don't, don't know that I could speak to the other, um, you know, maybe the history or the, the reasons for or against it because um, a lot of that's before my time. The largest issue that I would be aware of is. Uh, that Kansas holds a distinction and other states, I don't know, it's kind of crazy, but we're the, the big state uh, when it comes to talking about omnibus boards. Uh, other states have, you know, a psychology board, a social work board, a addiction counselor board, and Kansas has omnibus. We're all together in one big happy group. Um, and I think, uh, well, we could talk about that for several hours, but there's uh, certainly some advantages and then some disadvantages. To well, I guess that. the other question would be um, for the other boards, um, well, for the other disciplines that the BSRB oversees, um, do all of them have positions on the BSRB? Like we're talking about adding a behavior analyst. I mean, are there uh, representative uh folks from these other disciplines on the board? I, I believe, yes, uh, because when the BSRB was founded back in 1980, uh, it was the uh, regulatory uh, entity for psychologists and social workers that came together. And so it originally started as two members of psychology and two members of social work. And then as more professions have come under the board, uh, professional members have been added when those came under. Um, and uh, so there are currently 12 members of the board, uh, eight professional members, four public members. So the other professions are represented by a board member. Um, so. That's how I remember it, Mike, from our discussion about it before, um, which was part of what we were advocating for if we we're gonna be governed by the BSRB, that we should have a voice at the table like the other disciplines that were also represented. That's my memory. The cynical view from APA on all that is that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of issues and a lot of history and all this, and uh, uh, we'll uh, put that on the agenda and we'll solve that issue come Can sometime I, in December. How's that? Um, I guess from a timing standpoint, though, I mean, if if we don't meet until December, if a decision is made that, you know, we do want to pursue legislation to add a member, I'm wondering if meeting maybe in November might be more appropriate. I mean, just given the time kind of pre-session work to gin up support, I don't know. Um, I, that's why we like your brain, because you do have that internal calendar because of all your advocacy work, right? So my I think has a valid point. If we're going to put that, if we want to discuss it to put on the agenda, we need to do it sooner rather than later. Well, this is where David's expertise comes in very handy also. He knows all the deadlines and all this and that. Do you think December would be too late to get something drafted up, David? 
so that there are some other items that I think would be appropriate for a bill. Um, and the next full board meeting is November 8th. So um, the, the next one after that would be in January. So um, I think, I think you know, if you had a discussion on this in December, that's probably after when we would try to look for a cutoff in terms of what would be added to the bill this year. Um, so, cause it would need to be in statute if you would, did have a member on the board uh, for behavior analysts. So um, there've been a number of discussions by the other advisory committees and the board earlier this year on things to go into a bill this year. But, um, but we are getting pretty close to the time to where um, if it's not already something the board has discussed to go into a bill this year, um, it's getting close to kind of the end of what we would need to have discussions wrapped up to actually have it be put in. And you're saving, David, you're saying a bill. Um, so would it be like just sort of a catch-all bill for issues for the BSRB or uh, could it possibly be more than one bill? Uh, so, so what we did earlier this year, there were two bills that were requested for introduction, but it was identical language. Um, it was an opportunity for the House and the Senate to work on those topics at the same time. And with the pandemic, there was concern that if one committee would have to stop meeting, the other one would be able to go forward. So, um, but so that we were, we requested two bills this year, but it was essentially the same bill. Um, but I, I think in terms of looking at, um, you know, something that would go into the bill this year, I think we're getting pretty close to, there's not an official deadline, but I think in order for the board to actually uh, vote to put something into a bill that would probably be something that's coming up probably in November. I, I would think, you know, unless the board wants to have a special meeting after that November 8th meeting, that's probably when they would want to have most of the items um, close to finalized. Well, I, I know that there are obviously a variety of things that would need to be ironed out before we, you know, had specific language, but, you know, given the timeline that you've just laid out there. I mean, I, I doubt that the additional folks that we've invited um, or the folks that aren't here, uh, all being behavior analysts, um, you know, I think they would likely all support um, doing this. So I guess I'm wondering if we have enough folks here to kind of pursue this or put on the agenda for the November 8th meeting. I mean, I suspect that we could put our heads together and um, prepare some comments uh, for discussion at that meeting if, if you feel that's appropriate. That's what I was thinking, Mike, because especially given um, your um, history and background with um, part of what we've done in Kansas, um, you could probably pull from your experience and get something put together if we got it on the agenda for the November meeting. So David, what do you think, how do you think that would be received if we asked to be put on the agenda? Uh, so I can, if, if you would like to provide public comment and speak to that topic, um, I can talk to the chair of the board to see if there'll be, um, you know, time for public comment at that November meeting. Um, and then I can uh, get back in touch with you. Um, the, the, the tricky thing, um, and so you don't want to have a violation of the Kansas Open Meeting Act. So um, in terms of having someone, you know, if, if you wanted to work on something to present to the board at that November 8th meeting, um, you currently have, I think, seven members of the advisory committee so you couldn't have you know, four members working on advisory committee items outside of a public meeting. Um, but I think you know, I'd be happy to talk to the chair of the board if you would like to have the opportunity to provide public comment at that meeting to kind of talk to an issue like this. Um, you know, I'd be happy to talk to the chair of the board about that. And the other issue is, uh... A standing part of the agenda would be reports from the different advisory committees. And so I would be on the agenda to make a report of this meeting. I certainly could address that issue. So David, how much detail um, would be required um, for 
uh, discussing this issue at the uh, next board meeting. I mean, would they need to see specific language in the bill and approve or oppose, or is it just the general discussion? And then after the general uh, topics are agreed upon, then the specifics of language is worked out after the fact. So the, the official language in the bill, the, the way it usually works um, is that the revisor of statutes office is the office that crafts the specific language that would go into a bill. Um, we, we have language in the past that we have, um, you know, brought to that office with the permission of a member of the legislature so that they can go about taking the ideas and putting them into the correct statutory phrasing. Um, so I, I think if, if this was limited to the topic of requesting to have a member of the board representing behavior analysts, um, you know, I think that idea could probably be brought to the board without okay. the specific phrasing, if, if it's Great. limited to that. Yeah. Um, Great. And I, I can look at the statutes to see if it's more complicated, but I think for most of them, that there's not a lot of detail in that section of the statutes. So. Yeah. And so this wouldn't be opening up our licensure bill. This would just be opening up something related to composition of the BSRB, right? Yeah, I, I believe this would just be in the one of the statutes that talks about board membership and it identifies okay. who is you know, appointed by the governor. So this is Linda. <laughs> and I, I want to ask what may be a silly question, but you said that we can't work on stuff outside of this meeting. If we can't do that, how are we gonna get any work done? Yeah, so it's, it's tricky. So there, there are rules that say that you can't have a majority of the advisory committee working on advisory committee business outside of an open meeting. Together. Together. Um, and so if you wanted to coordinate something to provide to the board, um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, it would be okay if like, you know, two of you wanted to work on something and then offer it, you know, for the board's consideration. Um, you know, as another another thing you could do, you know, the advisory committees are charged with um, if there's recommendations the board asks the advisory committees to review and provide feedback on, mm -hmm. or sometimes the advisory committees can make recommendations to be, you know, uh, forwarded to the board. So that's another option for you. Um, I, I just want to make sure that you're clear that if you if you wanted to work together after the meeting on something for the board to consider. Um, you just want to make sure that you don't involve a majority of the advisory committee outside of the meeting working on something. That, that's kind of what I was trying to say. Okay, so it could be two of us, or if there was 10 members, it could be three of us, as long as it's not. And, and I suppose it's because of my previous history where we're going out and getting information and bringing it back and presenting it, right? Because nobody had any experience or information about what behavior analysts did, number one. Number two, any of the um, state level committee work, like when we were on the, um, um, aut the legislative task force on autism, it's like all of the work that we did was outside of the public meeting, right? And then we were generating reports and bringing it back. Well, David, just so I understand, I mean, I think I heard you say, I mean, you, it's not, um, it's acceptable for individual members to work on issues outside of the public meeting. It's just that we can't represent the committee to the board without having consensus among all of the committee members or advisory members. Is that what you were saying? Well, you, you can make a recommendation at this meeting if you're, if you're all, um, you know, if you want to make a recommendation and then that, that recommendation can be forwarded to the board through the chair of the uh, advisory committee. Um, but, but yeah, it, uh, you know, if you went to the board and spoke, um, you would want to make sure that if you represented the advisory committee, the advisory committee had weighed in on that um, ahead of time. Um, but the, the, the main point I was trying to make is that if you wanted to, um, could you have asked about if you wanted to provide public comment to the board at a board meeting? Um, if, if a few of you wanted to work together on some language to maybe bring to that public comment time, um, you just want to make sure that 
the work you do in preparation for that doesn't involve the majority of the advisory committee working together on something that would be considered advisory committee business outside of an open meeting. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure I don't um, do something I'm not supposed to do because I'm typically at first ask forgiveness afterwards. <laughs> so just kind of want to make sure I'm like, you know, minding my P's and Q's here so that I don't yeah. get me or any other, you know, don't misrepresent the field in a bad way. Well, David, yeah. just so and you have an idea of the kind of the information I was thinking might be of value for the board to hear is kind of, I mean, I have access to information what other states are mm -hmm. doing That's what um, as, it, as it relates to representation, um, you know, on boards or, you know, I would say most other licensing boards, you know, as Bruce referred to, have independent behavior analyst boards um, overseeing. It's not an omnibus like Kansas, but um, I, it might be useful to see what other states are doing. Amongst the uh, BSRB board members, if you ever have any questions about open meetings, because it is pretty subtle and uh, strange to me, because I like to pick up the phone and talk to people about stuff, uh, call David. He'll, uh, he'll set you straight. Yeah, and, and we did have a series of trainings for the advisory committees earlier this spring. We actually had legal counsel for the board come to each of the advisory committee meetings and walk through about an hour long training that talked about the Kansas Open Meeting Act, um, Kansas Administrative Procedures Act, and just different responsibilities and roles as advisory committee members. And so I thought those were pretty good trainings and they're up on the BSRB YouTube channel um, from those meetings around like February or March of earlier this year. Um, but, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure you're cautious about those type of things. Um, and, and also there's, there's sort of a, it's, 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 a, it's called a chain communication. So you want to avoid that too, where, you know, um, it can be a violation of open meetings. If there's a conversation that would involve all the members, even if you didn't directly talk to all of them, but if you talk to two of them and then those two talk to another two, so you don't want to have a situation like that. If you do choose to work on things outside of the meeting, you just want to make sure that your communications are limited to less than the majority of the advisory committee. Um, and there's different rules for staff members. So you're always, you know, feel free to contact me and I can assist you with anything you're working on. Um, but I just want to make sure that you're aware of those restrictions based on your, uh, you know, capacity as advisory committee members. You'll come to love coma and kappa discussions, which is what this is all about. My lips are sealed from this point forward. <laughs> okay, anything else? So I, I guess, David, just to, to be clear, so um, you will follow up with this prior to the November 7th meeting then on whether or not this is gonna be an item on the agenda. Yeah, I'll, so, so my understanding, right, that you, you want the opportunity to provide public comment at the meeting on this topic, is that? Well, I, I guess um, I, I would defer to you as to the best approach, but I mean, I think that what we would like to do is in, include this issue as part of your omnibus bill. Um, uh, and I'm not sure when I mean, if that decision is made at the November 7th meeting, um, and if so, how do, you know, if providing public comment at that time would effectuate that, um, that's what we would like to do, I guess. Okay. Well, if it's, a, if it's officially a recommendation of the advisory committee, then it, it says those recommendations are forwarded to the board through the chair of the committee. So that would be something that um, Bruce could talk to you at the meeting during his report on the advisory committee. Um, now, there's no restriction on anybody who would, you know, if you wanted to provide public comment, I could talk to the chair and um, it just kind of, you have some options there. Um, but if, you know, if it is your recommendation here to ask the board to consider that, if that's a recommendation from your advisory committee, then that can be forwarded uh, to the board through your chair. Well, I think, I mean, given that currently, you know, our committee is five and we've got three here. I mean, is that enough to make a recommendation? I mean, is that? 
because yeah, so we're there, talking about adding folks. So currently we don't have those additional folks. Uh, so, so let's see, you have, so there are seven members. Uh, so you need four for the majority. Um, and so, uh, so you do currently have a majority of the members of the advisory committee. Uh, so you can make a recommendation now if, if you would come feel comfortable doing that. So. I do. I do. So what would that be? To, Precisely. To add a behavior analyst to the behavior analyst to the uh, BSRB. Okay. A, a, a licensed behavior analyst. To the BSRB. Kim, do you agree? Yes, I do. Okay, so David, I would be, you know, more than comfortable including that in my report uh, about what we discussed at this uh, meeting. Okay. And so we report that, then what's the next step after that? And, and I'll, I'll talk to the chair too, um, to see if it can be listed as an agenda item. Um, and, and so it, it either would be on there as an official agenda item or um, go ahead and bring it up during your report as an item for the board's consideration, because um, then the board could amend its agenda if it's not already on the agenda by that point. And then if the board feels comfortable voting on it, then they could go ahead and consider it, because um, it says the board has the ability to consider recommendations from the advisory committee members at their full, full meetings. So. Um, but I, I, will, I will reach out to you and let you know, um, you know uh, and, and if you do want to provide any comments back to me, uh, that would be helpful in that regard. If you have information as far as other states that uh, maybe have, have something in place that you would want the board to consider, um, that could be something that I'd be happy to go ahead and provide to the members of the board because um, any of that documentation could be helpful. Just make sure to go ahead and send it to me directly and I can, I can collect it for you. And then if we were um, to provide public comment, I don't, I mean, I don't think we all need to provide comment. I mean, I think we could designate somebody to do that. Um, so I don't care who does it among us. I mean, I can, but I guess in the interest of time, I think probably don't need all, you know, more than one person commenting. I would think including uh, some other information like how other states are proceeding and that kind of data um, because this has not been discussed with the full board yet. So, you know, when this comes up, this will be totally new to these folks. And I would think that, you know, you know, making a strong argument, with a lot of data, a lot of support and all this and that would be better than just, you know, come up with, um, to say, Hey, they want to have another board member. And if you, that might generate a you know, groundswell of negative reaction to that, that might be uh, difficult to uh, put a dam in front of. So you're saying it's not good enough just to say Missouri does it? it <laughs> I'm kidding. It's Missouri, okay. <laughs> No, I think, you know, it needs to be a little bit more of a polished presentation. Yeah, and, and I think, um, Kim, I don't want to speak for you, so I'll just speak for myself. If I had to give my spot over for somebody to speak to this, it would be giving it to Mike. I agree. So, so I guess our request is if we, you know, if they allow for public comment, then yeah, I'd be happy to provide it. So David, he should be in contact with you about being on the agenda for public comment or directly to Leslie. Uh, you can go ahead and just, um, I'll reach out to the chair of the board um, and say that I received a request for public comment and um, explain to her you know, what, what topic it is. And then I'll, I'll communicate back with you, Mike, and let you know that uh, there's been time approved for public comment at the board meeting. So. Okay. Okay, so that sounds good. All right. Well, thanks for the clarity around that. So we'll get that. And then at that next board meeting will be when uh, 
our new four members will, will officially become part of the advisory committee. And uh, then we can proceed. And, you know, I, I mentioned a December meeting time. Uh, if we wanted to, we could even go, you know, late November, although we're getting into Thanksgiving and, you know, complications there. But. So I think December would be fine. Um, as long as we, um, uh, as long as we're um, participating in that November larger board meeting, the actual BSRB meeting. Does anybody see any reason why December wouldn't work? <coughs> I'm sorry, what, what day did you say that was? November 7th is a meet. Sunday. I thought you were saying. Meet on the second Monday of the month. Yeah, I think okay. it's November so the ninth. Uh, oh, second so Monday be, would be the Monday, Monday November eighth. Yep. Okay, and then the board won't meet again until the second Monday in January. So we're at the, uh, let's see, we're, we're the 27th of October now. <clears throat> We've got, what, a week and a half until the next board meeting, so. That shouldn't be too terrible long. So <clears throat> since December is um, a big holiday month as well, are we thinking that the next advisory board meeting would be sometime in that second full week of December, like the 13th through the 17th? Yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of you know, early December sometime. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll send out some options to you in terms of times and dates. Um, I'll avoid some other meetings we already have on the schedule um, and then just go ahead and fill that out and just let me know and I'll take the States that have the most members availability. Sounds good. Okay. Do we have a plan? Yep. Sounds okay. like we have a plan. Good. Um, well, I want to thank you all for participating in this meeting. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's not wait three, four, five years until the next one. So. <laughs> All right. And, so. and yeah, Bruce, if you could ask for a motion to adjourn whenever you're ready, and then we'll uh, just get a second on that, and that just to have it for the record. So. Okay. Can I do my usual? Yay. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Yay. <laughs> Those in favor say aye. 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 Suppose we don't care about you, Phil. So, I'm sorry. So thanks for uh, your time today. I, I think we've accomplished a lot. It's been a productive working meeting and we will uh, be communicating here shortly about the next steps, okay? Sounds good. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.